Welcome back everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Jake and on this channel we break down finance and investing issues to make things easy for you. And in today's video, we got a good one because we're going to go over the difference between mutual funds and ETFs. Which one is better for you? And before we can cover mutual funds and ETFs, we need to first talk about actively managed funds and passively managed funds. Actively managed funds have real people whose job it is, is to deliberately buy and sell securities. It's their decisions, their choice. They're trying to outperform the market. And passively managed funds, those uh, are operated by a computer, an algorithm. And mostly they're just designed to track an index, maybe the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, the S&P. There's no decisions being made. However, the market performs that passively managed funds just are designed to track that index. And on my channel, I will never recommend to anyone actively managed funds. They're terrible. And there's a whole host of reasons. I can make a separate video about this. But one is there's a lot of, a lot of fees, a lot of upfront fees or hidden fees. Actively managed funds additionally have really high expense ratios. Usually the expense ratio will be 1% of the fund performance. Additionally, they're tax inefficient. With uh, managers buying and selling more frequently in an active fund, they have to pay short-term capital gains more often. Whereas an index will maybe only redistribute once a quarter in order to reduce their tax, uh, their tax inefficiency. Additionally, even if you find a good actively managed fund that has outperformed the market the last five or 10 years, Past results do not guarantee future results. Uh, the, the leadership teams at these uh, funds can change over. It can be different people managing the funds. There's no guarantee in the future that the fund will continue performing well. And then the most important reason is there's a whole host of studies and data showing that actively managed funds, when you take into account the fees and expenses, do not outperform the market average. This seems like it should, you know, professionals should be able to do better than the average, but they can't. And this is really confusing, which leads to a lot of fund managers doing something called backdoor indexing, where they know that they cannot outperform the market average so they just copy an index and then they sell it to you as if they are actively managing the fund. And they do that to collect fees. They do that to take that 1% cut of the fund performance. So let's just do a quick math example. Let's say that you were maxing out a retirement account, 6,000 a year for 30 years and you were getting 8%. After 30 years, you'd have $734,000. But if instead you get into an actively managed fund that underperforms the market or just copies the market and then takes 1% from you, you're only getting 7%. That leaves you with $606,000 or a difference over 30 years of $127,000. That is what the actively managed fund uh, ha has taken from you in order to pay for their salaries, their offices, uh, their nice cars, everything that these banks need to survive. If you want to learn more about actively managed funds or indexes, I highly recommend the book Unshakable by Tony Robbins or the Little Book of Common Sense Investing by John Bogle. I personally have read these. They're about 200 pages. They're not complicated reads. And what, what banks do I recommend on this channel? I always recommend Vanguard, Schwab, or Fidelity. These are established banks, full service banks that have good reputations. If you get into an ETF or a mutual fund, make sure that the expense ratio is below or close to 0.1%. If you're confused whether it's an index fund or an actively managed fund, if, there's, if, there, if the one is over here, if it's 1% or greater, that's an actively managed fund and I highly recommend you avoid it. Now on this channel, I will only ever recommend index mutual funds or index ETFs. However, you might now have the question, Jake, what exactly is an index? So let's cover that real quick. Once again, there are many indices that people can track their performance to. The Russell 1000 or 2000, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones. The most popular is the S&P 500. S&P stands for Standard & Poor's. 500 means the 500 largest companies publicly traded in America. And if you Google S&P 500, you will get this number, 3,315. What does that number mean? Well, it's an aggregate of the total value of the 500 largest companies. So if you look at the market cap, and market cap is share price multiplied by number of shares, 
the value of a company, the total value of the S&P 500 is $33 trillion. So that 33 stands for 33 trillion. And when you look at a company like Apple, Apple's market cap is currently $2 trillion. The company is worth $2 trillion. What percent of the S&P 500 is Apple? Well, you just do 2 divided by 33 and you get 6.1%. So when you invest in an S&P 500 index funds, you are invest you you want you want the percentage of the fund to be 6.1% Apple stock. And indexing is fabulous because it gives you a broad diversification. You're in every sector, you're in small, medium, large caps, and you're not picking you're not picking winners and losers. Nobody can accurately predict the future. We don't know which companies will be the biggest companies 20 or 30 years from now, so we just buy them all. And you know, as they slowly get bigger, we buy more of them. As they slowly uh, do worse or shrink in size, we sell them off. If you think back 20 years ago, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, these were not the largest companies in America. But if you invested in an index fund 20 years ago, you were slowly buying more as these companies got bigger, which is why S&P 500 index funds do pretty well. Real quick, we can go on Vanguard's website and look at their list of Vanguard mutual funds. And when you sort by expense ratio, which fund is the cheapest to get into? At 0.04%, you can buy VFIAX, which is Vanguard's uh, 500 index admiral shares. Let's click on that and then scroll down and this will show us what, what is this fund made of? Well, it's uh, made of these 10 largest holdings, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Berkshire Hathaway, Johnson & Johnson, Visa, Procter & Gamble, NVIDIA. This is th these 10 companies is 30% of the fund and uh, you're in every sector, energy, materials, real estate, utilities. And if you, want to, if you want to know specifically what does this fund own, go ahead and scroll down and click on Portfolio Holdings. And Vanguard just shows you what is in this mutual fund. Well, there are 334 million shares of Apple worth $43 billion in the fund. When you buy this fund, you buy a share of the fund's total. So by buying one share of this fund, you're getting a very small fraction of the value of this 334 million shares of Apple. Same thing when we go on Vanguard's website for their ETFs, just look for Vanguard ETFs, sort by expense ratio at 0.03%, ticker symbol VOO. This is Vanguard's S&P 500 ETF. And when you look at what is its holdings, it is, uh, let's see here, uh, 10 largest holdings, 30.2%. Let's go back to the mutual fund version. 30.2%. It's the exact same 10 companies. So this is deliberate. The mutual fund and the ETF have the same holdings and the same performance, and this is by design. And the reason why is because S&P 500 index funds are awesome. When you look at their return over the long run with dividends reinvested, you can, you can earn on average 9.8% a year. Uh, now, once again, this is a long-term average. You need to be invested for a time period of 20 years or so to expect to get this. Some years it'll be up 30%, some years it'll be down 30%. If you're a buy and hold investor, you don't care. So for the three companies that I recommend, Vanguard, Fidelity, and Charles Schwab, Vanguard's S&P 500 index fund is VFIAX. At Fidelity, it is VXAIX. At Schwab, it is SWPPX. Vanguard does have the ETF uh, version, VOO. Fidelity and Schwab don't actually. They have other ETFs, but not an S&P 500 ETF. So they recommend you go with IVV. This is managed by BlackRock. Once again, a good company. And uh, SPY is a very popular S&P 500 ETF, and this is operated by State Street. Once again, a, a, a good cost for fund performance. Okay, we finally understand active versus passive, and we understand what an index is. Now, what is the difference between a mutual fund and an ETF? Let's break it down one at a time. So a mutual fund is purchased directly from a bank. If I wanna buy Vanguard mutual funds, 
then I can open a Vanguard uh, IRA or brokerage account in order to do so. It is possible with my Vanguard brokerage account to buy Schwab mutual funds. However, when you go bank to bank like this, they, they might charge you a fee, like $40 a purchase or something. So if you are going to commit to mutual funds, I highly recommend banking with the investment bank that you're going to buy the mutual funds from. Otherwise, there could be fees every time you buy and sell. Now, ETFs don't care. ETFs are mutual funds that act like individual stocks. They're mutual funds that have been repackaged, repurposed, and they're currently being bought and sold on the New York Stock Exchange. So they behave exactly like a stock. Now, because ETFs are bought and sold on the New York Stock Exchange, there's a lot you can do with them, like shorting or exercising options. This is probably more advanced uh, information than you need to know, but for active investors, this is really appealing to them. With mutual funds, the biggest limitation is that you only know what the value or the price of the fund is once a day at the end of the day after the market's closed. If you want to buy or sell uh, any part of your mutual fund, you can only do so once a day at the end of the day when the markets are closed. Additionally, mutual funds might have a minimum amount required in order to initially buy into the fund. That Vanguard mutual fund I showed you, it has a $3,000 minimum in investment in order to initially buy into the fund. After the first purchase, you can dollar cost average in $100 a month if you want, but for that first purchase, it has to be $3,000. With an ETF, it doesn't matter. You can buy just one share, whatever the price may be, and a lot of brokerage accounts now have enabled fractional shares. So if you want to buy $1 of an ETF, you can actually do that. And the biggest difference and one of the biggest draws towards people choosing mutual funds over ETFs is currently you can auto deposit from a checking account into your mutual fund. So if you want to set up direct deposit from your checking account into your Vanguard uh, mutual fund, $100 a month, $500 a month, uh, mutual funds allow you to do that. ETFs don't. Because you're buying and selling securities on the New York Stock Exchange, there is no way yet to auto-invest. However, they're working on this, especially now with fractional shares. This functionality might be possible soon. Additional information about mutual funds is the value of all mutual funds is much higher than that of ETFs. Mutual funds have been around for like 140 years. The value of all holdings uh, is, is close to $19 trillion, where ETFs have only been around since the 90s, and their value is about $3.5 trillion. And the traditional domain of mutual funds has been 401ks. 401ks became popular in the 1980s, and employers who uh, take uh, uh, deductions from your paycheck in order to participate in an employer 401k plan those are all exclusively mutual funds right now. Yes, they might also have company stock, but for the most part, it's mutual funds. And when you're dealing with uh, retirement accounts, 401ks and, and, and IRAs as well, taxes year to year don't matter because uh, 401ks and IRAs are tax advantage accounts. You're not paying taxes on capital gains year to year. So buying and selling within a retirement account uh, doesn't really matter. Another benefit to a mutual fund is you don't actually know how it's performing during the day. And there's a lot of people that don't want the anxiety when the market is really down or maybe even when the market is up. Uh, they like that mutual funds are a little bit more hands off and you don't know exactly how they're doing in the wild swings of crazy days. So when we compare that to ETFs, especially in the era of smartphones, you're constantly seeing how your fund is performing every second of the day. And some people don't like this. They don't want to be watching the volatility of, uh, of the stock market. But for active traders, for people who uh, want to be able to use uh, stop losses and limit orders, uh, ETFs are more appealing because it gives you greater control of, of buying and selling. However, if you're buying and selling these ETFs, that is really tax inefficient. If you sell in less than a year any, any capital gains that you earn, you're taxed at the short-term capital gains rate, which is higher than if you had just held it for longer than a year. An additional thing to know about ETFs is when you buy and sell on the New York Stock Exchange, there is a price difference between the bid and the ask. 
It's called the spread, what buyers and sellers are willing to trade. And it, if the fund has good volume and liquidity, it's only a couple pennies, but when investing on a time scale of decades, every penny counts. And then finally with ETFs, since they've exploded in popularity, uh, when you think about how many of them there are, on the New York Stock Exchange, there's 2,800 companies publicly traded. However, there are over 5,000 ETFs in existence. And honestly, I, I can't justify why there are so many. There's a lot of crazy uh, niche ones, you know, leveraged ETFs, commodity ETFs. I would never recommend uh, buying into an ETF that doesn't just track a general indice like the S&P. So final thoughts, what do I recommend? Mutual funds or ETFs? Well, if you're a set it and forget it, passive kind of investor. You don't want to pay attention to the markets day to day, and you're willing to just go with a single brokerage company, Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, then just buy their mutual funds. Set up automatic investing, uh, don't even think about it. Just keep buying mutual funds every month and you're set for life. However, if you're a more active investor and you want to be paying attention to the markets every day and you want to, uh, you know, uh, maybe short sell, sell options, uh, have uh, limit and stop orders, if you want the more functionality that comes from ETFs, then that is the better option for you. Only thing I recommend is whatever broker you're with, uh, make sure that they have zero commission trades, trades for buying and selling and, um, you know, just uh, j just be careful out there. Okay guys, that's all I got for this video. If you thought it was good, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. In addition, consider subscribing. I talk a lot about finance and investing issues. And if you have any comments or questions, leave me one down below. I love hearing from you guys. And until the next video, take care.